When a truck driver steps on the brake pedal, they're not directly stopping the wheels. They're releasing a powerful wave of compressed air, over 100 psi of pressure. That force travels through tanks, valves, and chambers, translating a simple pedal press, into thousands of newtons of stopping force. This is the air brake. And today we'll uncover how this system is designed not just to stop, but to stop safely, reliably, and under full control. Trucks have an engine-driven air compressor that continuously pumps air into the system. The compressor's crankshaft and connecting rod convert the engine's rotational force into a vertical linear motion, driving the pistons up and down, compressing air with every stroke and feeding it into the brake system's reservoirs. However, if the compressor operates continuously, what mechanism prevents the system from exceeding safe pressure limits? This is controlled by the air governor. A pressure actuated control device that continuously monitors the pressure within the reservoir tanks and regulates the compressor's cut in and cut out cycles accordingly. It connects to the supply reservoir via an air line, allowing reservoir pressure to enter the governor through its reservoir port. This same pressure also interacts with the air dryer, which we'll cover shortly. But first, let's take a closer look at how the governor actually works. The air governor has several key parts. A reservoir port. A piston. An inlet exhaust valve. A pressure setting spring and an unloader port. As the air compressor runs, and pressure builds in the reservoir, air pushes against the governor's internal piston. This piston, along with the attached valve, moves against the resistance of the pressure setting spring. When the pressure reaches the governor's cutout setting, typically around 120 psi, the piston moves far enough to close the exhaust valve and open the inlet valve. At this point, reservoir air flows through a passage inside the piston and exits via the governor's unloader port, heading straight to the compressor's unloader mechanism. This air pressure activates the unloader pistons inside the compressor, forcing the inlet valves to stay open, and as a result, air compression stops. Once the system's pressure drops to the cut-in point, typically around 100 psi, the governor spring pushes the piston back. This closes the inlet valve and opens the exhaust, allowing the unloader air to vent out through the governor. With the pressure gone, springs inside the compressor, return the unloader pistons to their normal position, seating the inlet valves and compression resumes. To safeguard the air system in the event of a failure, in either the governor or the compressor unloader mechanism, a safety valve is installed on the supply reservoir. This valve is usually set to open at 150 psi. It operates using a spring-loaded stem that presses against a seated ball valve. When the pressure in the reservoir exceeds the set limit of 150 psi, the pressure forces the ball off its seat, allowing excess air to escape through the exhaust port. At the heart of a dual circuit brake system are three key reservoirs. The supply reservoir, the primary reservoir for the rear axle brakes, and the secondary reservoir for the front axle brakes. These reservoirs are interconnected but protected from one another by a single check valve. The supply reservoir is the main source of compressed air. From here, air flows through the check valve into the primary and secondary service reservoirs. The check valve allows air to move in only one direction, from the supply reservoir to the service reservoirs, while preventing any reverse flow. This is crucial in case the supply reservoir pressure drops due to a malfunction or leak. 
The check valve design is simple but very effective. It contains a supply inlet port, a valve seat, a spring, and a delivery port. When air pressure from the supply reservoir exceeds the spring force, the valve opens, letting air into the service reservoirs. If the pressure falls, the valve closes, sealing off the service reservoirs to retain braking capability. To ensure compliance with safety regulations, the air pressure in both service reservoirs is monitored and displayed on a dual pressure gauge mounted on the dashboard, providing the driver with real-time information on brake system readiness. The air produced by a vehicle's compressor is 100% saturated with water vapor. When temperatures drop, this vapor condenses into liquid water, which can damage components and affect brake performance. To address this issue, a desiccant air dryer is installed between the compressor and the supply reservoir. Its job is to remove 100% of solid and liquid contaminants, and approximately 95% of the water vapor, before the air enters the brake system. During normal operation, known as the charge cycle, compressed air from the compressor enters the supply port located on the air dryer's end cover. As the air flows through the end cover, it begins to cool, causing some contaminants to condense and collect in the end cover sump. The partially cleaned air then enters the oil separator, where additional liquid and solid contaminants are removed. Still saturated with water vapor, the air moves into the desiccant cartridge, passing through the desiccant drying bed. Here, the water vapor is removed through a process called adsorption, where moisture clings to the desiccant material. Most of the dry air exits the cartridge through the integrated check valve, filling the purge volume between the desiccant cartridge and the outer shell. From there, air travels to the delivery port and on to the supply reservoir. The air dryer stays in this charging state until system pressure reaches the governor cutout pressure, typically around 120 psi. When system pressure hits 120 psi, the governor sends a signal to both the compressor and the air dryer. This signal causes the compressor to unload and triggers the purge cycle in the air dryer. Air from the governor enters the control port, moving the purge valve piston. This action does two things, closes the turbo cutoff valve, sealing the dryer's inlet port to prevent turbo pressure loss, important if the compressor is turbo fed, and opens the purge valve, releasing contaminants collected in the end cover sump through the exhaust port. Simultaneously, the check valve closes to protect the supply reservoir from pressure loss. Dry air stored in the purge volume reverses direction and flows back through the desiccant cartridge, passing through a small orifice near the check valve. As it expands, it becomes super dry, stripping away the accumulated moisture in the desiccant material, a process known as regeneration. Any remaining contaminants in the oil separator are also expelled during this purge. The entire purge cycle lasts around 25 seconds and continues until system pressure drops to the governor cut-in level, typically 100 psi. When the air pressure drops below the governor's cut-in threshold, the governor vents air from both the compressor unloader and the air dryer's control port. With the control pressure removed, the purge piston is pushed back by its return spring, causing the purge valve to close. This action resets the air dryer, and the system transitions back into the charging cycle. This charge, purge sequence repeats continuously, maintaining a consistent supply of clean, dry air to the brake system at all times. The service brake operation begins at the two service reservoirs, which serve as the starting point for a dual or split brake system. To utilize these separate reservoirs effectively, the system relies on a dual brake valve, a single unit that contains two independent valves housed together, both operated simultaneously by one foot pedal. The actuation components include the pedal, the plunger, the roller, 
boot, and fulcrum pin. All working together to transmit the driver's input into braking force. Internally, the valve consists of several critical components. The spring seat. Graduating spring. Primary piston. Primary inlet and exhaust valves. Secondary piston. And secondary inlet and exhaust valves. Each reservoir delivers compressed air to its designated supply port on the dual brake valve. The primary reservoir supplies air for the rear service brakes and the parking brake, while the secondary reservoir serves the front service brakes. In the valve's default, unactuated state, both circuits are closed, and the delivery ports are open to the atmosphere, venting through the exhaust. When the brake is applied, pressing the treadle pushes the plunger down onto the spring seat. This compresses the graduating spring, causing the primary piston to move. As it travels, the piston first closes the primary exhaust valve, then unseats the primary inlet valve, allowing pressurized air from the primary service reservoir to flow into the primary delivery port. Some of this air also flows through an internal bleed passage into the secondary piston cavity, where the pressure buildup pushes the relay piston forward. As the relay piston moves, it closes the secondary exhaust valve and opens the secondary inlet valve, allowing air from the secondary reservoir to flow into its delivery port. Now let's explore where the air from the brake valve goes, and how it activates different parts of the truck's braking system. Most manufacturers configure the braking system using a front rear axle split. The primary circuit, shown in green, controls the rear axle service brakes and the spring brake service portion. The secondary circuit, shown in orange, operates the front axle service brakes. Once the driver presses the brake pedal, air pressure flows through the dual brake valve, sending compressed air into both circuits simultaneously. Air from the secondary circuit enters the front brake chamber, which operates similarly to a piston in a cylinder. This chamber consists of a pressure plate, non-pressure plate, and a flexible diaphragm sandwiched between them. A return spring holds the push rod and plate against the diaphragm's non-pressure side. When air enters through the inlet port, it pushes against the diaphragm, forcing the push rod outward. This mechanical force is transmitted to the slack adjuster, which rotates the S-cam, spreading the brake shoes against the brake drum to slow the wheel. The braking force depends directly on the air pressure applied to the diaphragm. When the driver releases the brake, air exits the same inlet port via the exhaust passage, and the return spring retracts the push rod releasing the brakes. While the front axle uses standard service brake chambers, the rear axle is typically equipped with spring brake chambers, which provide both service braking and emergency or parking brake functions. Internally, the service side of a spring brake chamber works like the front chamber. However, a large mechanical spring inside the chamber applies the brake if air pressure is lost, making it fail-safe. We'll cover that in just a moment. The first component to consider is the double check valve. This valve serves two purposes, it directs airflow to specific functions and selects the higher pressure from two possible sources. For example, parking brakes can be controlled using air from either the primary or secondary reservoirs. The most common design uses a shuttle housed in a guide inside the valve body. It has two inlet ports and one delivery port. 
When air enters one of the inlets, the shuttle moves in response to the pressure, sealing off the port with lower pressure while allowing air to flow through the delivery port. If pressure levels change, the shuttle automatically reverses its position without obstructing airflow. The blue line indicates the parking or emergency air circuit. The spring brake system serves dual functions on the rear axle, it acts as the service brake and also provides emergency and parking braking. The service brake chamber contains a pressure plate and a non-pressure plate, separated by a flexible rubber diaphragm. A return spring holds the push plate and push rod assembly firmly against the non-pressure side of the diaphragm. The rear section of the spring brake assembly, often referred to as the piggyback, includes several key components. A strong spring. Diaphragm. Emergency piston. Emergency air inlet port. And a release bolt. When the vehicle is started, air pressure is directed into the diaphragm, compressing the spring and holding the brakes in a released position. The spring brake chambers are designed so that air pressure releases the brakes, while the removal of air pressure applies them. This is the opposite of how service brakes function. With strong spring lifted, a service brake chamber can function without obstacle while vehicle is moving. When a brake application occurs, compressed air enters the chamber, expanding the diaphragm. This expansion drives the push rod and push plate outward, overcoming the resistance of the return spring. As a result, the brake is applied. That concludes our video for today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.